This is the day we celebrate in the life of the church, Christ the King Sunday. Crown him with many crowns. It's the last Sunday of the church year before the beginning of Advent, and next Sunday evening we're going to begin a very special series for Advent here at 6 o'clock that will be different from the morning services. So I hope you will come and join us for our evening services. We're reading tonight from the book of Revelation, the opening section of the book of Revelation, but as a word of explanation, John is speaking to the church in the first century world, and John has been given visions about what is happening and what is to come. And as he opens the book of Revelation, he draws upon a vision that Daniel has, the prophet Daniel, of one who in human form comes descending from the clouds, to whom will be given dominion over all things. So with those thoughts in mind, hear now this word from the book of Revelation, the first chapter beginning at the fourth verse. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priest serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him and even those who pierced him and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious God, you give us this vision of the end of time. And we pray that in our insecure world, we would know your security and peace. Speak to us your word of life and hope. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Every good story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's the hope of every parishioner in worship that a sermon will have a good beginning, a very short middle, and a challenging end. Every life has a beginning, a middle, and an end. We are held in the mind of God, we are born, we live out our days, and at the end of time we return to our Creator. Even the creation itself has a beginning, a middle, and the end. The book of Genesis tells us that the Spirit of God moved over the unformed chaos. And God spoke by the word the creation into existence. And then in the midst of time, in the middle of creation, that word became incarnate in Jesus Christ. And accompanies the world until its final consummation when Christ returns. Even the universe has a beginning, a middle, and an end. You see, the Bible is a story. A story of God's activity, of God's mighty acts. A story of the creation, the redemption, and the consummation of all things. Now, I know there are people who read the Bible like a rule book. You know, you open it up, you find a rule, you find a a teaching, a law, and you say, okay, that's it, and you close the book. Well, there are rules, there are laws, there are teachings in the Bible, but that's not the center of the Bible. There are people who, who read the Bible as if it were a kind of book of wisdom. Let's find some nice saying in Proverbs, and we'll live by that. And then we find that saying, oh, here it is. And then we close the book, and we're done. Okay, we'll live by that. Well, there are wise sayings. There's great wisdom in the Bible. But that's not what the Bible is all about. That's not the center of the Bible. The center of the Bible is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. For the Bible is a great story start to finish. And if we ever read the Scriptures in any other way than as a great story of God's mighty deeds, at the beginning and the middle and the end, then we really miss what the Scriptures are all about. 
But we live in uncertain times. Over these last few weeks, we've all been shaken to the core, devastated by news of violent terrorist attacks around the world in, in, in Lebanon, in, in Africa, and in Paris. We live under threat. Even right now in Brussels, the schools and the subways are still closed. Out of fear of a subsequent attack, people are staying at home. Do you know that the United Nations Refugee Agency says that there are 59.5 million refugees and displaced persons in the world? Almost 60 million people. And what is even more astonishing about that statistic is that this has increased by 8 million in one year. 22 million increase in 10 years. More displaced people in the world today than there were at the end of the Second World War and all the displacement that occurred in the field of conflict. And what is most disturbing is that 30 million of these displaced people are children. But the insecurity, the uncertainty, the the brutality of life is not only out there, but it is also here in our own city. We are concerned, we are troubled by, by persistent poverty, by troubles in the school, by violence in neighborhoods or, and even in homes, by drugs, by so many different problems that families face, the, the breakup and the fracturing of family life. We're troubled by food insecurity. Did you know that yesterday when our own food pantry was open, that over 50 families from Washington Township came and received food, an abundant amount of food. But every time the pantry has been opened this month, at least 40 households have come for food. 21,000 pounds of food in October alone. Life is pretty tenuous. Life is pretty insecure. For a whole lot of people. But this is nothing new. I mentioned the prophet Daniel. The prophet Daniel spoke a word that meant a tremendous amount. Gave great courage and strength to the Jewish people. In the second century before the coming of Christ. For the Jewish people lived under the heel of the Seleucid monarchs. And there was a particularly nasty one. Named Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. Don't you like that name? Don't go naming your children that. Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. Epiphany, the manifestation of God, or so he thought. And he wanted to prove that he was really God's manifestation by determining that he was going to crush out, destroy the Jewish people. And he almost succeeded until his death in 164 before Christ. But it was this vision of Daniel of one descending in the clouds to whom would be given dominion and power, who would rule over all peoples and all nations. It was this vision that they received from God that gave them hope, that kept them secure, that empowered them as they lived through a time of great distress and suffering. And I think that is why John opens the book of Revelation with an echo to Daniel's vision of one who descends with the clouds And every eye will see him. And it is the same one who came in the middle of history. Will come again at the end of history. The one who was crucified. Who died for our sins. And whom we have our life and our redemption. And he will come again. For John was writing these visions that we have in the book of Revelation. Not to scare people. Oh no. But to give the people in a time of great persecution. Great hope. So I ask you, where do we find our security? In whom or in what do we trust? I've spoken often about the first congregations that we served in a rural county in eastern North Carolina. Many of the folks in those congregations were people who I would say lived what I would call on the edge. That is that when the economy would turn down, they were the very first people to let go at the mill, to be let go at the mill. There seemed to be a much higher than average health concerns and disease and problems with medical care 
and a much lower than average access to good health care than we would have in an urban area like this. Family problems? They weren't just out there, they were in here. Violence, abuse, divorce, trouble, difficulties, they were all there. And it was so interesting to me when I think back on it that one of their favorite hymns to sing, and I don't think I understood why at the time, was the old hymn, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Why? Because in all the insecurity and the fleeting character and the changeable nature of life, the unpredictable things that would impact their lives, there was Christ, the foundation of their lives. And all other ground was sinking sand. And they knew that this Christ, this Jesus, held their lives They knew their stories were wrapped up in his story, that they were a part of that great story that the Bible tells of creation and redemption and consummation. And they may not have put it like this, but they knew that their destiny was tied up in the destiny of Jesus. And that no matter what happened to them in this life, they belonged to him on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Yes, this is Christ the King Sunday when we remember the great foundation upon which we stand. But it's also the beginning of Thanksgiving week. And so you see here on the the communion table, the cornucopia. Even the children this morning in worship knew what this was, the horn of plenty. The fruit of the earth. Remembering us of all, reminding us of all the material blessings that God gives, the 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 gift of family and friends, the work that we've been called to do, the harvest, the abundant food that we've been given to share with the hungry world. But you know, this is Christ's table too. And not only do we have these material blessings in our lives, but we also have these spiritual blessings, the fruit of the Spirit, the gift of Jesus who saves us who nurtures us, who nourishes us, who holds our lives in his hands. The rock upon which we stand. The close of our worship tonight, we're going to sing a hymn that's familiar to some of you, but it has, I think, such incredibly beautiful words. Because it ties together the gifts of creation with the gift of redemption in Jesus. Just listen to a few of them. For the fruit of all creation, thanks be to God. Gifts bestowed on every nation, thanks be to God. In the help we give our neighbor, God's will be done. In our worldwide task of caring for the hungry and despairing, in the harvest we are sharing, God's will is done. And for the harvest of the Spirit, thanks be to God. For the good we all inherit, thanks be to God. And most of all, that love has found us, thanks be to God. The bounty of the earth and the harvest of the Spirit, thanks be to God. No one of us here can ever predict what will happen to us in our lives. But we are invited to live our lives in the care and keeping of Christ our King who accompanies us through all our journeys until life's end. This past week, our Lakefellows had the opportunity to join with a local rabbi for a seminar We had a wonderful morning with the rabbi. We talked about about the Jewish faith. We talked about the interpretation of Scripture, the, the place of the Torah, how the faith is kept in the home and in the synagogue. We talked about contemporary issues for the Jewish community here, and we talked about the conflicts in Israel and Palestine. It was a wonderful, open conversation, a real time to learn and to share. And near the end, someone says, Now tell us, why do you wear the little hat? Well, in Hebrew, it's called the kippah. We know it more familiarly by the um, 
Yiddish name, the yarmulke. Why? The skull cap. He says, well, we're supposed to wear it for prayer and for meals and for study. But many Jews choose to wear it all the time. When you go out with your friends, when you're uh, serving in the community, when you go shopping, when you're just having a good time. Why? Because it reminds us of who we are and the one who keeps us. Now, we don't wear special hats or even special clothes, but we do certain things together to remind us of the rock upon which we stand. What do we do? We worship. We sing and we pray. We study the Bible. We say the words, the creed. We remember each week those truths that we hold in the very depth of our being. We give ourselves in, our, in service to others because Christ came into the world, not to be served, but to serve because Christ meets us in the stranger. We give our resources to say, this is what matters to me. This is what is important in the world. This is the faith I live by. No, we don't wear a particular hat, but we do certain things together that hold us fast that invite us to stand firm upon the foundation of Christ. There was a graduate of the Naval Academy who was serving in the Navy. His young family was there with him in California when he was stricken with polio. And when he recovered from the initial illness, he realized that he would never be able to walk again. His legs were paralyzed. He figured out, he says, I've got to find something to do to support my family. So he decided to go to law school, and he became a trial attorney. He tried cases in the county seats all over South Carolina. And some of those courthouses were 19th century courthouses built by Robert Mills, the same guy that designed the Washington Monument. Well, they didn't think about people with handicapping conditions in those days, oh no. The courthouse, courtrooms, second floor. And so he would lock his leg braces in place. He would take his arm braces and crutches and he would literally pull himself up the stairs and enter the courtroom because nothing was going to stop him from doing what he felt called to do. He was an elder in the church, a state senator, a tireless advocate for education in a state that sorely needed better education. He was a champion for civil rights before that was a very acceptable thing to do for a white middle-class person in that state. One day he had a heart attack. It was a very severe one. He was taken to the hospital, and when the word got around the congregation that he had been stricken with a heart attack, it's amazing. The waiting room literally filled up with people from the church because he'd had such an impact on the lives of people of all ages, from little children to old adults. And when he heard that there was a number of people gathered there praying for him, he said in his wonderful humor, Well, since so many folks from the church are here, I guess it's time to take the offering. Those were almost the last words he spoke. But he lived his life on the solid foundation of Christ. And he knew that no matter what happened to him, the end would be good because the end is Jesus who comes and every eye shall see him. The end of your life, my life, this world, the creation itself will be good because the end is Jesus. Amen.